Welcome to Running on Ice, the coolest community in freight. I'm your host, Mary O'Connell, bringing you the latest tech updates, warehouse news, and everything happening in the cold chain world. Not only is there the coolest show on freight, there's also the coolest newsletter, and you can subscribe to that on freightwaves.com slash running on ice. Before we get into our guest interview, let's get into some headlines. Pre-qualified for last mile pharmaceutical delivery of refrigerated products, the Temp Aid Thermal Insulator Insulated Mailer with integrated PCM refrigerants allows specialty pharma and mail order drug organizations to transport individual doses of medication that must remain in a cool, refrigerated, and at a stable temperature within a sleek envelope. Compared to the standard shipping solutions, the mailer saves shipping costs by up to 77%, requires no assembly, reduces the risk of packout failure, and costs up to 22% less, is seven times smaller and 50% lighter, and is vacuum-packed for shipping to reduce shelf storage space. A technique using structural colored liquids could help identify when medicines have been exposed to damaging temperatures. Currently, electronic time temperature indicators are used for this purpose, but this generates a significant amount of electronic waste. Other material-based TTIs have been developed using color-changing reactions or dyes, but these eventually fade or are only effective above freezing temperatures. Researchers have developed a system uh, based on the structural color pro- produced by photonic crystals. When this device is exposed to temperatures above the target temperature, this trigger agent melts and diffuses into nanoparticle suspension, breaking apart the microcrystals and causing irreversible color loss, thus indicating that the drug has been spoiled. New York City-based Oatly introduced two new flavors to its line of plant-based ice cream, banana split frozen dessert pint and the chocolate chip cookie dough frozen dessert pint. Oatly's banana split and chocolate chip cookie dough flavors are available at retailers nationwide for a suggested retail price of $4.99 for a 16-ounce pint. Today we are joined by Greg Tuthill, Chief Commercial Officer at CQ. Thank you so much for joining us today, Greg. Thank you. I appreciate you having me. I'm kind of getting, I'm excited to get into this. This is something that I will admit it's not the first thing that I know a lot about, and that's refrigerated containers. Um, and so I'm really excited to get into that today. But before we jump too far in, why don't you give us a quick rundown on your background and how you got started at CQ? Sure. I, I've been in the container industry or container shipping industry for over 30 years. I started with CQ five years ago in 2018 coming from the liner operator side of the business and um, delighted to be here. It's uh, we're in the leasing and finance business to support the major shipping lines. Uh, Focus primarily on refrigerated container leasing, but we also uh, lease dry containers, gensets, and also have a new initiative in the portable cold chain uh, market as well. So that's exciting for us to explore a new growth initiative tied to the cold chain. So basically anything that someone would need for a container, you guys got it. You guys are just the one-stop shop. Yes. Yeah. We've been in business for 30 years. We uh, have a well-established reputation, uh, significant customer portfolio, and uh, we are certainly, um, again, focused mostly on the refrigerated container leasing side, but also do other asset types and financing uh, solutions as well. So that's kind of what I wanted to get into. Can you kind of explain the role of refrigerated containers? And, you know, um, I think you recently had some article come out that was talking about the reducing food spoilage with these refrigerated containers. So what's kind of the role that these containers play in the overall reduction of waste in the food supply chain? Great question. Um, Let me first start by saying that the container transport uh, arena has really been dominated by refrigerated containers being kind of the primary um, vehicle to move uh, perishable type refrigerated commodities. So one, um, the container is being probably put at the top of the list in terms of moving produce and perishable commodities. Um, Two, it's probably had the largest or most significant advancement in technology applications which assists in food mitigation waste, as well as uh, more efficient transport in the perishable commodities uh, areas. So um, I think what we'll see is uh, containerization, uh, specifically on refrigerated container transport, will be uh, the top moving um, transport mode as we continue to go forward. I think that kind of goes hand in hand with everything that we're seeing from some of the research coming out in cold chain, whether it's the rise of frozen food, 
or just the rise of you know having produce available year round um we had a couple guests a couple of weeks ago that was talking about how you know even in the winter time we're still able to access blueberries and strawberries and other fruits that aren't you know naturally growing in 20 inches of snow um But because they're able to harvest them down in like South America, where it is summertime, then it's we're able to have that food year round. And I think as we kind of lean into that part of the truly global supply chain and everybody working together um, and, you know, trying to end some food insecurity, I think that that's really going to contribute to that rise of those refrigerated containers and the need for them and, you know, the need for really just reducing any amount of potential waste in the supply chain through transportation. Like it's one thing if it just doesn't sell at the store, but um, it shouldn't, we shouldn't not have the opportunity for someone to buy at the store because of some improper um, handling throughout the supply chain, you know? Correct. I call that all year seasons. And what I mean by that is we have now afforded us, we, the refrigerated container uh, transport mode has afforded us and many other communities to benefit of having uh, seasonal fruits uh, all year long. So therefore, um, that has really proliferated in terms of the outreach of sourcing for these type of commodities, but also it's provided uh, larger and more significant markets for some of these uh, commodities as well. So yeah, a lot has been um, a lot has been done uh, with respect to technology, longer transits, and outsourcing, and the outreach for the, some of these commodities, uh, which again has afforded you know many markets and consumption areas and locations uh, with the benefit of having some of these uh, products uh, provided all year long. Yeah, I am one of those people in one of those markets that loves the year round. Um... I love the year-round apples. I love the year-round strawberries. Strawberries are one of my absolute favorite fruits. So if I can walk in in December, and I know they're going to be more pricey than they are in the summer, but if I can walk in and get some delicious strawberries in the middle of December, I'm a very happy person because, you know, I just, I like it. And that's the thing that I like that has come selfishly as a consumer. That's the thing I like from the all seasons is that, you know, I can have access to this produce um, because otherwise it gets just a little depressing in the summer where you're like, oh, or the winter where you're like, what am I going to have again? Oh, more, more squash. We love squash. Don't get me wrong. I like squash, but you can only, you can only like squash for so long. You know, I, I was just going to say, I think your, your comments are are valid and, and certainly um, very current because people want to have blueberries in their cereal all year long and it's it's happening and we know that because the consumption markets are proving that to be true uh and we have the data now to prove that uh, point as well yeah i mean nobody really likes eating oatmeal in the winter time with just brown sugar and nothing nothing else going for it um but you kind of touched on some of these commodities and different things that utilize these temperature or these refrigerated containers what specific commodities or industries or what products within that area arena are the most prone to spoilage that kind of not necessarily need to be handled with like white gloves, but like maybe need a little bit more attention to them and just some extra, like, you know, some of those extra services that come with a temperature controlled product. The, uh, yeah, the sensitivity to some commodities is certainly uh, a lot greater than others relative to uh, having a perishable or shelf life that's more limited. So so the refrigerated technology is really playing an important role, but some of the commodities would include avocados, melons, uh, any type of berry, which includes strawberries, blueberries, um, and anything like that. Um, the lettuce family, kale, uh, those are the type of products and perishables that are really subject to spoilage if not treated uh, properly with the right application in terms of the transport on management and also uh, settings and monitoring. I kind of feel like that's those are those are the produce that are kind of the bane of everyone in the temperature controlled spaces existence. Um, from moving um, from moving the freight either stateside here with certain humidity settings or storing them or you name it, you look at a piece of kale wrong and it's gonna go bad. So I think those are kind of it's nice that even on a bigger scale that companies are still having to have those those stragglers and those little little stinkers that are still going to be the the problem children more or less where you know they have to have these very specific requirements or you can't look at them on a Tuesday and they're going to just wilt away 
Yeah, that ties right into uh, food waste mitigation. Uh, so the technology has advanced such that we uh, we have a lot more um, capability and technology and engineering uh, based on the machinery improving as well, that we have uh, better outcomes, lower failure rates. And I think the most important, which we're talking about, is we have the opportunity to go ahead and outsource from distances that are much further away than in the past and longer transit times, uh, again, with very, very positive outcomes in terms of delivery. So we have, we have a lot to work with now that we didn't have before, and it continues to advance as we, uh, as we go forward. So something that you touched on was that technology component. Um, what is some of the, I guess, the cooler tech or um, some of the cooler things to come from this technology that in, that isn't so entrenched within these refrigerated containers? What's some of that tech that's come out recently that you're like, oh, actually, this is really cool? Because, I mean, we all love the little temperature sensors that you can stick inside a cube, but um, what's some of the either the monitoring software or some of the other tech that's come out that you're like, hey, this is actually like really helpful and really cool. We did a good job here. Yeah, two key developments that really play an important role in um, refrigerated commodity transport. One would be the hardware, which is the telematics uh, devices, which are part of the machinery and also part of the container. And that, re that allows us to do remote monitoring, remote uh, adjustments and uh, administration, controls the environment, the cargo environment. So that's humidity uh, that also uh, can look at early warning diagnostics. So before a failure occurs, there's remote monitoring and change management controls that allow uh, an operator uh, or someone that is at least tracking that cargo to make the appropriate changes to prevent failures. So that's, that's one. That's really the technology and the software platform advancements that have come a long way just in the last five to 10 years. The other side of the technology application that's allowed us to go ahead and uh, have better outcomes and more successful delivery um, is the controlled atmosphere technology. And that really is a uh, technology that allows uh, an operator to change the environment, the cargo environment, to slow down respiration of the commodity. So fruits and vegetables, uh, the, resp uh, uh, the respiratory rate of those commodities tend to accelerate uh, spoilage. So to slow that ripening process down during the, um, during the transit makes a big, big difference. So that technology has really uh, advanced, number one, but number two, it has allowed for uh, successful delivery and reduced failure rates. Uh, the fact that you can kind of control the environment in a little bit uh, is reminding me of one of the Olympics where uh, China just like decided to make it rain or make it snow all of a sudden. They could control the atmosphere, um, which is weird to do in a big city. But for a container, I absolutely love because it's like, no, no, you you just are going to stay right here in this perfect little like homeostasis state where you're not going to you're not going to basically it's like a road trip with a bunch of kids in a car the parents look, turn around and say, will you just quit breathing on each other? You guys have basically captured that into technology. So that way it's just like everybody's just not going to breathe on each other and that's how we're going to make it. Yep. So so a lot of advancement in that area and uh, it has really proven to be um, a technology that has significantly reduced the, uh, the food waste as well as the uh, failure rates. So there's something that you touched on earlier is the failure rates and kind of stopping them uh, before it happens. But, you know, this is logistics. This is supply chain. Nothing ever goes as planned. Um, or if it does, just wait five minutes and then it won't. Um, so if that is the case, how do you guys, like if you have a container in the middle of the ocean on a ship and all of a sudden you get an alert that, you know, it's probably going to stop functioning or, you know, there's a problem and in two hours you have a concern, but that ship is like days out. How do you guys kind of, is there like a fail safe in place that ex that happens with those containers that you're like, hey, how do we stop this from going bad in two hours? Or do you just kind of then go back to the customer and say proactively like, hey, this unit failed. Um, we're going to have to just process this claim when it comes in. The early warning diagnostics piece of what I described earlier is playing a really important role in preventing failures. So 
Um, the, maybe the first point of clarification is since we're just a leasing company, we don't operate and we don't control and we don't uh, administer shipment um, movement, but our customers do. And what we do is provide that consultation and certainly some of the uh, guidance to make sure that they can properly uh, prevent failure. So getting back to your question uh, specifically, the early warning diagnostics, you know, from a controller data feed, which means is a compressor going bad? Do we have refrigerant leakage? Um, do we have a pressure malfunction with an expansion valve? You know, getting down to those technical details allows the operator to go to shipboard um, staff or, um, or the team on the maintenance team to really go in and, and try to go ahead and, and recover that load by making the appropriate maintenance um, changes or, or replacements for that matter. So it's really, really helpful to go ahead and try to get that data prior to a failure occurring. That has to be absolutely game changing. If I see on my, like if I'm a shipper and I see, oh, container 12, is having a compressor problem and I can see exactly where that con compressor problem is, then I can just, what I assume, call the ship and be like, hey, can you go look at this compressor, wave your compressor magic. Um, I will apologize. I do not know how to fix mechanical things, clearly. Um, and just like wave your compressor magic, fix it, and then I don't have to worry about this spoilage. That's also completely game changing because also if I run this, I'm assuming you can run the diagnostic before the ship even leaves. And if I see this container is, you know, maybe needing a little bit more maintenance and it might not make the full week, two week journey, then I can pull it and swap it out for another one. And I feel like that has to do a lot with prevention is just knowing what kind of equipment you're working with before you start. Yeah. Preventative um, diagnostics and early warning diagnostics uh, and, and the technology from the controllers, from the machine with the data feeds is really proving to be uh, a big, big advancement in terms of um, mitigating failures, but also making sure that that cargo environment is properly maintained. So the remote administration of these controllers as well as a big, uh, big step in the right direction because temperature, humidity, airflow, you know, those are just a few of the examples that can be controlled remotely. And I think that makes a big difference as well. Uh, where 10 years ago or 20 years ago, that wouldn't be able to happen. And of course, uh, you know, you don't know what you don't know. So the visibility uh, is certainly um, visibility and the ability to control uh, some of the settings remotely is, is a big, big game changer, as you said. So I guess um, when it comes to the amount of uh, waste or whatever. I know that the technology and I know that the refrigerated containers do help mitigate that, but what industries are probably the most, uh, the biggest offenders when it comes to having waste or just having things go wrong or in transit? What industries are, you know, maybe have the most room for improvement in regards to some of these um, ad ad different actions they can take to prevent spoilage? Well, I, you know, specifically, uh, it, it's all kind of wrapped into the food uh, transport industry. I would say that I don't, I don't think there's any one industry that's worse than any, any other industry. Um, I do think transport um, mode differentiation makes a big difference. I think that uh, bulk commodity refrigeration type transport modes is starting to be phased out. And of course, the container transport um, um, you know, mode is certainly becoming the priority and also it's, it's probably going to be the primary mode. So I think that back, you know, in the day when we used, uh, large refrigerated vessels carrying bulk commodities, I think it was much more difficult to control the atmosphere, number one, but number two, the outcome, uh, just because of the, um, the, the mere fact of how it's loaded and access. And the monitoring uh, was certainly, uh, you know, far less than what it is today. Okay. So looking forward, what do you, like 5, 10, 20 years from now, what is your great hope or what do you think the future of refrigerated container shipping is going to look like? Or what do you want it to look like in a perfect world? I think one thing that's going to really uh, start to get advanced is down to commodity box level 
monitoring. And some of that can happen today, but when you look at the, you know, the causes or some of the issues related to failures, um, some of it is as simple as loading and some of it is as simple as airflow. So while we have the capability of managing the cargo environment, getting down a product level monitoring, I think will be something that will be advancing quite quickly, but that will really allow us to look at one load relative to the outcome down to a specific carton. And that would, you know, that's, that exists today, but I think it'll continue to advance. Um, I think the other thing that will help would be, and, and I say this, uh, being a little bit uh, premature with the whole idea, but AI technologies relative to transportation logistics um, with refrigerated commodities, I think that's going <clears> to <throat> play a big role in the future. And not not that it might eliminate jobs, but I think it's going to allow us to go ahead and have a lot more efficiency. Uh, the conveyance for delivery right to the uh, store shelf um, or a refrigerated section of a grocery store will make a big, big difference in how we go ahead and mitigate transfer and handling errors, which is the big thing also tied to refrigerated transport. So those are just a few things I think will uh, will be exciting to see and watch develop because I think it's going to make a big, big difference in, in how we uh, effectively and efficiently get product from uh, the farm to, uh, you know, the, uh, the store, but also uh, right down to uh, farm to fork type uh, movement. I would love to see the data behind that package level, that like that individual product level data. I would love to see that. Um, I also am very excited for AI. I've long since said that AI isn't necessarily going to, you know, take over all of our jobs, but they're just going to enhance and kind of automate the stuff that we hate. Like nobody really likes sitting there. As a I was in the grocery store the other day and they have a little robot that goes and scans and like basically makes the list of what needs to be filled. Um, obviously the robot can't fill the shelf, but uh, as someone who used to stock shelves, that was always my least favorite task was going around and writing down what needed to be stocked. So um, I'm, I'm here for these partnerships, the things that make it easier. Um, I love it. I'm excited to see what it can do in the container world and the refrigerated, the, the temperature controlled well world as well. But we are almost out of time, but there is a question that everyone that comes on the show has to answer. Uh, and it's a little silly, but we love our, we love our question. So Greg, is cereal considered a soup? <laughs> is cereal considered a soup? I guess it depends if it's um, heated and if there's too much milk put on the cereal. But um, no, I would, <laughs> I guess, um, I would say no. Uh, and I guess that's my viewpoint, but uh, cereal doesn't appear to have the same qualities as a soup. It doesn't to me either, but there are some out there that say that it could be considered a soup because, you know, there's cold soups, there's different kinds of like mushy cereal that turns into a soup and is served hot, like People have very strong opinions about it. I can say that I can say this. I've had soupy cereal, if that makes a difference. It does. It does. It makes a difference. Um, so that being said, if anyone wants to, you know, slide into those DMs, take on your cereal take, or if they have any questions about refrigerated containers or anything, where can they find you outside the show? Anyone can email me at uh, G Tuthill. T-U-T-H-I-L-L -L at cqubecontainers.com. I'll be happy to answer any questions uh, over email and uh, certainly would welcome any input comments or uh, suggestions on uh, future transport modes. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Mary. You can catch other episodes of Running on Ice right here on Great Waves TV or YouTube or anywhere else you get your podcasts like Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Need more Running on Ice news? No sweat. You can subscribe to the newsletter on freightwaves.com slash runningonice. See you on the internet.